Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, invited delegates, dignitaries, the faculty members from the various universities and colleges, the officers of the university, the students, the learners, and my dear colleagues. I, Chayanika Sanapati, take this opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of Krishna Kanta Mundigoy State of the University to the one day national seminar on the theme Role of Fast Track Codes in Delivering Justice to Women. This seminar has been organized by Bani Kanto Kakoti Research Institute, Krishna Kanto Mundigoy State of the University, in collaboration with the National Commission for Women, New Delhi. This national seminar will attempt to address the significance of fast track roads in providing justice to women in India and Assam particularly. And this seminar will assist in developing a complex and subtle and comprehensive understanding of the issues that the fast track code addresses. So before moving further, I would like to request all present here to kindly rise for the university song. is here our best as a chief guest for the seminar. We are again indeed privileged <coughs> that Srimati Rumi Kumari Kukon, former judge, Gamati High Court, is here our best to deliver the keynote address. May I now request and invite Honorable Vice Chancellor Krishna Kanta Hondigoi State of University and the President of the seminar, Professor Rajendra Prasad Das, on the day and kindly occupy the chair. I would like to invite Professor Malik Gopal Mahanto to kindly occupy the chair of the days. 
Next, we look forward for the presence of Srimati Rumi Kumari Kukon to the dais. Again, I would like to invite Dr. Arun Jiti Choudhury, the registrar of the university, and Dr. Prasenjit Das, the chairperson of the seminar and the director in charge, Manikanto Kakodi Research Institute, to the dais and kindly occupy their seats. We would like to begin the event by paying homage to Ma Saraswati and lighting the ceremonial lamp. I take the honor of requesting our chief guest, Professor Nani Gupal Mohanto, to offer tribute to Ma Saraswati and light the ceremonial lamp. Also, I'd like to request the dignitaries on the days kindly to accompany our chief guest and take part in the proceeding. It is a privilege to have amongst us, as the chief guest for the seminar, Honorable Advisor, Education to Government of Assam, Professor Noni Kupal Mahanto. He teaches political science in Guwahati University and was also the head of the department in 2018-19. He is also the director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Guwahati University, which was established by the government of Assam to facil facilitate research and people-to-people -people contact as part of the Act East policy. His research in interest includes India's Northeast and Southeast Asia, peace and conflict resolution, human development and security, insurgency, ethnicity, and identity politics. He did his MA from JNU, New Delhi, and PhD from Gauhati University. He was also a Rotary World Peace Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, from 2002 to 2004, where he completed Masters in Peace, Con Peace Conflict Resolution and Policy Studies. Professor Mahanto was a visiting fellow at the Peace Research Institute, Oslo, and Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. He has an illustrious list of publications. His most recent book, The Citizen, the, his most recent book, Citizenship Debate over NRC and CAA, Assam and the Politics of History is an important contribution in understanding the complex question of identity and citizenship in Assam. Besides academics, Professor Mahanto is also deeply involved in policy making. Among his several such engagements, the most recent one is being a member of the State Innovation and Transformation IO CETA. Assam during 2016-2021. I welcome you, sir. I request our Honorable Vice-Chancellor, Professor Rajendra Prasad Das, to offer the felicitation to our esteemed chief guest with a full arm gamosa and a bouquet on behalf of the university. For this, I would like to request Dr. Shmiti Chika Choudhury to assist Honorable Vice-Chancellor, sir. Again, we are honored and it's a privilege to have amongst us Honorable Retired Judge of Gauhati High Court, Srimati Rumi Kumari Kukon, as the keynote speaker for today's seminar. She has a very distinguished career three decade, for over three decades in legal services. She enrolled herself in the Bar Council of Assam in the year 1987 and started her career at Jorhat District Court. In 1988, she joined Assam Judicial Services and has worked in various capacities like Chief Judicial Magistrate, Session Judge, Principal Judge, Registrar Judicial, Registrar Administration and Registrar General of Gauhati High Court. She was elevated to the bench of Additional Judge at Gauhati High Court in the year 2015 and subsequently elevated as permanent judge in the year 2019. She has retired just last June after her illustrious legal career. I welcome you, ma'am. Again, I would like to request our Honorable Vice-Chancellor to felicitate the esteemed keynote speaker, Srimati Rumi Kumari Fukon, with a full arm gamusa and a bouquet on behalf of the university. I would like to request Dr. Indrani Deka to assist our on our Honorable Vice-Chancellor, sir. A 
we would also like to take this opportunity to felicitate our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajendra Prasad Das, who has very recently joined our university. He has got vast teaching and administrative experience and we are very fortunate to have him to guide us to scale newer heights. Before joining our university, he was the senior most pro vice chancellor of Indira Gandhi National Open University. Prior to that, he was the vice chancellor of Berhampur University, Berhampur, Odisha from the year 2016 to 2019. He has taught for more than three decades in a number of premier institutions in the country starting from XLRI Jamshedpur, Jivaji University Gwalior, Bikram University Uchain and Pandit Ravi Shankar Shukla University Raipur. He has been a visiting faculty to IIM Raipur and several other leading business schools of the country. He held various administrative responsibilities in these institutions besides his academic duties. He also acted as member and chairperson in various teams, committees constituted by AICTE, NAAC NAC, and UGC. He has got a rich list of publications which includes five books, about 100 research papers published in highly <coughs> acclaimed journals. We feel really, very really proud and privileged to have, have him as the Vice Chancellor of our university and I request our registrar. Dr. Aurobhjati Choudhury to kindly felicitate him with a full arm damusa and a bouquet on our behalf. For this, I would like to request Dr. Shantishika Choudhury to assist when staff, sir. <laughs> now, I would like to request Dr. Prosenjit Das, the chairperson of the seminar, to felicitate the registrar of the university, Dr. Arupjiti Choudhury, who is also an eminent, eminent academician of the state, with a Kulam Namusa and a bouquet. I'd like to request Dr. Indrani Deka to assist the chairperson of the seminar. May I now request Dr. Kanta Chakraborty, the assistant registrar of the university, to felicitate the chairperson of the seminar and the director in charge, Manikanta Kapoti Research Institute, with a full Anga Musa. May I now request Dr. Prasenjit Das, the chairperson of the seminar and the director in charge, Manikanta uh, Kapoti Research Institute of this university, to extend the welcome address to this august audience. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Rajendra Prasad Das, Honorable Education Advisor to the Government of Assam, and the Chief Guest of today's National Seminar, Professor Noni Gopal Mohanto, Keynote Speaker Srimati Rumi Kumari Kukon, invited distinguished, distinguished speakers of various technical sessions, Register Dr. Aurukjati Chaudhuri, Directors of various schools, officers, faculty members, research scholars, learners, of the university, invited guests, media persons, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone present here today. A very good morning to all of you. First of all, I welcome you all to this one day national seminar on role of fast track, uh, fast track courts in delivering justice to women. And we are thankful to National Commission for Women New Delhi for sponsoring this seminar. I am happy to inform the gathering that the National Commission for Women have also sponsored a national seminar on gender, on gender sensitization in India's <coughs> Northeast issues and challenges that was held in 2020, just before the COVID-19 pandemic hitting the entire world. The Panigandu Kakoti Research Institute was established in the year 2016 with the objective to undertake research activities on the problems and processes of social transformations and economic and human development in the state of Assam and the Northeastern region. It was formed with the purpose of contributing to the formulation of strategic programs for integrated regional developments. Some of the important activities of BKRA in recent years include annual Panikanto Kakoti Memorial Lecture that is held on 15 November each year, 
roundable discussion on the alternative paradigms of living with flood and soil erosion that was held in 2018, area studies program that was initiated with the first visit to Bhutan in the year 2018 under the minor research project on Bhutan that was entitled Bhutan in Transition, a Decade of Experiments with Democracy, 10-day research methodology uh, course in social sciences in collaboration with Indian Council of Social Science Research, talk on Gandhism in International Perspective by Professor Sudarshan Iyengar on Gandhism in International Perspective that was held in 2018. As research and development is an important dimension of a university's academic pursuits, there is an urgent need to redefine the role of the KRI in view of the changing social and academic context following the COVID-19 pandemic and the release of the new education policy 2020. Besides academic collaboration and networking with regional, national, and international institutions and organizations has been seen as one of the prime objectives of quality enhancement and to the effect, the KRA will try to play a leading role in the days ahead. This national seminar is part of the collaborative endeavor of BKRI and NCW New Delhi and it will address a very pertinent issue that is women's access to justice or women's limited access to justice and the role of the judiciary in that direction. Available records imply that the lack of justice reflect women's experience of being disadvantaged, exclusion, discrimination, and violence. Besides, gender-specific barriers such as biases in the justice institutions, social stigma, psychological trauma, etc., while claiming justice, the lack of gender-sensitive procedures, violence against women, etc., prevent women from utilizing the available pathways to seek justice and to realize their full potential as well as rights. Therefore, the need of the hour is to have a people-centered and gender-responsive justice approach to create an enabling environment where women can seek remedies without fear of negative consequences and rejection and also realize their rights through timely access to justice. Women's limited access to justice can often be considered a complex social phenomenon that indicates a series of inequalities at the legal, institutional, structural, socioeconomic, and cultural levels. Today, uh, today's seminar will provide a common platform for various stakeholders belonging to fields such as the police department, the judiciary, and organizations and agencies working for the cause of women which together constitute a justice chain and women's economic prosperity, bodily integrity, voice and agency can never be protected if any one of them does not function well. That is why perhaps we, have, uh, we often say that justice delay is justice denied. As the concept of access to justice covers contact with, inquiry entry to and use of the legal systems, I'm happy to inform that we have systematically arranged the various technical sessions and accordingly invited distinguished speakers belonging to Guwahati High Court, Assam Police, and organizations like uh, uh, North East Network and Women in Governance in India. I'm sure the speeches to be delivered in the inaugural and valedictory sessions, uh, inaugural session will set the tone of the seminar and all the participants will have sufficient idea of the proceedings of the day-long seminar. I am hopeful that the deliberations to be made by the distinguished speakers of the different technical sessions will lead to a fruitful and meaningful discussion and interactions on the role of the judiciary in ensuring justice to women. With that expectation, I would like to wind up my short speech here. Thank you for your patient hearing and see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting that. May I now take this opportunity to invite the chief guest for today's seminar, Professor Nonikul Balmahanta, 
to address the August audience with its words of wisdom, knowledge, and experience. Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Rajendra Prasad Das, Honorable Ma'am Retired Judge Rumi Kumari Fukam, Register of KKH Krishna Kanta Handik State Open University, Professor Dr. Arun Juti Choudhury, sir. Dr. Prasenjit Das, Director of today's seminar. <coughs> Dear participants, paper presenters, and ladies and gentlemen. At the very outset, I would like to express my deep sense of gratitude and thanks to the organizer for having given me this opportunity to speak a few words on the role of fast-track courts in delivering justice to women. Well, I am not an expert on this particular issue. I am a student of political science, nevertheless, and uh, I am engaged with recently with a lot of policy-making issues of the government of Assam. And as such, I am away from research-oriented activities of social science in general and political science in particular. Nevertheless, and I see here presence of a galaxy of intellectuals here who are expert, expert in this particular domain. But nevertheless, since I have been asked to give my presentation, it's not necessarily an expert's viewpoint, but general observation as a student of political science, uh, a more cursory look rather. Well, uh, the question arises, Already we have been distributed a copy on uh, crime against women, particularly in the state of Assam, uh, which remains a critical factor in the socio-political fabric of the state, particularly a state which is known for very elevated position of women. Uh, why the state for last maybe eight, nine, ten years, that there is a marked increase in crime against women, that is the issue to be pondered particularly, as has been already stated in the statement, in three areas, domestic violence, kidnapping, and molestation, particularly from 2016 to 2019, there is a very sharp rise. And in fact, uh, our crime against women is higher than the national average. And uh, it has been stated, I just like to give a few statistics to put the issue in perspective. For example, in spousal violence, more than 6.5% increase in 2019 and 20. Eight percent young women reported sexual violence, which is an increase of 3.2% from 2015-2016. So, therefore, various data, you know, as stated by National Family Health Survey, particularly four and five, and the transformation from four to five, we find a big rise in the various graphic indications of crime against uh, women. And the proportion of wives who have reported violence by husbands increased from 24.5% to 32%. The number of women aged between 18 and 29 years who reported sexual violence increased to 8%, which is up from 5.8% of uh, National Family Health data of 4. Now, more rural women in Assam reported spousal violence uh, around 32.9% than urban women, which is 26.6%. So, the data are in front of us, uh, which is already distributed. After having gone through all this data published by NFHS, NCRB, uh, and Assam Police, particularly I am relying more on Assam Police data. I have tried to collect them for last 10-15 uh, days and I have, you know, my presentation is based on the data given by Assam Police. So a few questions come to my mind. What are those questions? Number one, uh, is it an increase in crime or an increase in reporting? Number one, whether such crime against women is it rural or urban in its nature? Thirdly, what is the nature of occurrence of such crimes against women? Is it essentially in the public domain or private domain? Fourth, whether crime against women is a general phenomenon or specific to certain areas, community groups, etc. Fifth, 
is there a common pattern? What are the most vulnerable districts that require urgent attention? And six, why is there a huge discrepancy of cases reported, report submitted, charge seated, and conviction? Why there is a huge discrepancy? As I look at it, crime against women in Assam defies all those categorizations. Due to increasing women empowerment, women now hardly hesitate to report crime against them. However, experts argue that these cases, be it in rural or urban areas, do not necessarily reflect the actual picture. Many cases still remain unreported and unregistered. Various factors may trigger for underreporting. The dependence of rural women on their spouses may act as a factor for not getting the actual picture. In urban areas, although the number of violence against women are increasing, including the FIR and reporting are also increasing, nevertheless, the link between reporting, the search seat and conviction is very, very thin. Patriarchal norms, family values, tradition, fear of being ghettoized if husband is punished, insecurity, etc. may act as factors. <coughs> Although some writings have identified seven districts of Assam, Dhubri, Jurhat, Hailakandi, Sipsagar, Borpeta, Bongaiga, and Hujai, districts with higher crime rate than the state average. However, such categorization does not necessarily reflect certain other issues. My argument is that we need to dissect certain data in order to get a complete picture. For example, when I say there is a huge discrepancy between cases reporting and conviction, for example, uh, uh, have you, can you give the, the data sheet, please? Yeah. If you look at this report, this data sheet, you will find that uh, this is Assam Police data from year 2021, that uh, there is a huge discrepancy between cases reported and the conviction even serves it. However, it is said that the kidnapping cases or the abduction cases are very high because there is an elopement and it is argued that about 33% of in the Assam's marriage takes place below the age of 18 or 19. Therefore, uh, many in many cases, uh, boys and girls get, uh, I mean, they get married or they get married by secrecy or elopement is the main factor for such uh, abduction and family immediately complains about uh, abduction or kidnapping and uh, although sometimes they are regular the relationship is being accepted by the family members so it does not necessarily uh, suggest that they are kidnapping or uh, you know uh, they are abducted but nevertheless the record is not taken out from the police department but even then, we find that there is a huge discrepancy between the cases reported, reports submitted, and ultimately the rate of conviction. Then here I am trying to look at the, you know, what are the districts that are vulnerable for these kind of crimes like dowry dates next, uh, cruelty by husband, kidnapping and abduction, human trafficking and rape. Uh, if you look at for example, in dowry dates, uh, there are cases of 156 in 2019 and Kachar, Dorong, Borbeta, these districts are very high uh, in terms of, you know, dowry dates. Then cruelty by husband, I have looked at, uh, I have looked at the Dhubri is the topmost with uh, 1,230 cases in the year 2019. The second is Noga with 972 cases and Guwahati is third with 878 cases. Now, it is the responsibility of the researcher. Why this variation? Why Guwahati is becoming the epicenter of violence against women of various nature? Well, this is not my domain. I appeal to the paper presenters and to the researchers to look into the case of Guwahati more particularly. Then coming to kidnapping and abduction, uh, we see 
that these districts like Borpeta, next uh, Borpeta, Kachar, Dorong, Dhuburi, Gulaghat, Guwahati City, again Guwahati City, Kamruk, Nogao are the main areas. And in this category of kidnapping and abduction, Nogao is the topmost to each 620 cases. Second is Guwahati City, third is Dhubri with 449. Then I have listed some the cases of human trafficking which perhaps require a separate attention. Then coming to rape, uh, next, uh, next slide please. Uh, coming to rape, again you will see these are the districts that are having most of the incidents of rape cases. Uh, then the last uh, slide please, last slide. Yeah, so this is the general, you know, those districts which are having a high rate of crime against women in totality. I'm talking about uh, in totality the cases of crime against women. When I have dissected this data, I have found out that there are four districts which need our special attention. What are those four districts that require our a kind of cluster approach that I would like to propagate. First is Borbeta. Borbeta is very high in dowry debts, kidnapping and abduction, human trafficking, rape, and it also is very high in total, you know, crimes against women. That is number one, Borbeta. Second is Dorong, where the cases of dowry debts, cruelty by husband, kidnapping and abduction, rape, and high in total crimes. Then third is Dhubri, cruelty in husband, then kidnapping and abduction, rape, and it is the highest district where you have the highest number of crimes against women, that is 2787, uh, perhaps in the year 2019, yeah, if I remember correctly, 2019. Now, uh, then Guwahati city, then Guwahati city, uh, it is high in cruelty by husband, kidnapping and abduction, and to tell crime cases. These are some of the statistics for you to reflect upon, to have a look at. Now, how do we uh, infer from this data? Uh, my argument is this, the above statistics defy urban rural divide. The magnitude may vary in certain areas, but the crime occurrences go beyond rural urban divide, although it is suggested that in rural areas, the occurrence is higher. Secondly, there is a tendency to depict upper Assam areas as more progressive. The EBO statistics, however, contradict that statement. In fact, in certain areas like Shibohagar, Jurhat, Gulaka, the record is abysmal. It also proves that literacy alone does not necessarily act as the only factor for less crime against women. Thirdly, it looks like, of course, it needs to be probed upon and it looks to be looked into is that in all the above parameters like murder, dowry, dates, cruelty by husband, kidnapping, abduction, human trafficking, rape and total cases of crime against women, the tribal districts, if we may say so, like Ensi Hills, Karpi Anglong, BT areas do not occur much those cases except in field areas. However, this is my observation and it needs to be further looked into uh, why in certain areas the crimes occur more and in certain areas there is less occurrence of crime against women on the basis of statistics that we have. So on the basis of next place, on the basis of the total next, uh, the ABC data, Subina? Yes sir, this one. Sir. Uh, this one. Sir. Yes sir. Uh, I have tabulated. Okay, take yes, it. You stop it now. Yes. So, on the basis of total cases that we have uh, in, in Assam today, uh, in terms of total cases of crime against women uh, in 2029, districts may be divided into three categories. Uh, the first is those districts above 2000, like, uh, you know, those districts where the crime against women is above 2000. These are Dhubri. 2,787, Borbeta, 2,296 cases, Nogao, 2,148, and Guwahati City, 2,143. That is the most crime prone districts. Secondly, total cases of crime from 1,000 to 2,000, 
Here I will put Kamrup, Dorom, Gujai, Morigaon, Kachar, Jorha, and Sipsakor district. That is category B. Then C category cases are from 500 to 1000 cases. These are Sunitpur, Hailakandi, Golagha, Baksha. So what I would like to argue that we need a more segregated approach and to look into those districts more uh, minutely why there are more violence against women in certain districts relatively uh, not in other districts. But having said I do not want to minimize the occurrence of crime against women in other districts as well. Now coming to the role of fast track courts, uh, right to speedy trial remains a vital fundamental right under Article 21. The Delhi High Court has held that speedy trial from an intrinsic, it constitutes an intrinsic part of Article 21 of the Indian Constitution and the denial of the same may be ground for the pain in certain, certain circumstances. Why fast court tracks? Court? We need those FTCs because the pendency of cases in district and subordinate courts increased from 26.1 million in 2018 to 31.7 million. In January 2020, an increase of 21% cases according to a standing committee report from March 2020. As all of us know, the Eleven Finance Commission recommended a scheme for creation of 1,734 fast-track courts in India. And the question is, how effective these fast-track courts are? That is the crux of the question. Now, my observation on the basis of a few cases as handled by the fast-track courts, my observation is essentially threefold. Number one, trials in fast-track court generally last longer. So the question occurs, does it take longer time than the general courts? Secondly, fast in letter but not in spirit. It looks like the fast court tracks are fast in letter but not in spirit. Thirdly, sweet and quick justice perhaps still remains an elusive concept. Nearly 81% of 26,965 cases completed by fast track courts in 2019 took anywhere between 1 to 10 years for the trial to be completed according to National Crime Records Bureau uh, data. Further, 69% of 17,155 cases disposed of by the protection of children from sexual offenses box courts in 2019 took between 1 to 10 years, the data suggests. This is despite the fact that POCSO Act 2012 specifies that the special courts must complete trial as far as possible within one year from the date of taking cognizance of the offense. Now the million dollar question is, even after 20 years of existence, the question occurred, why do India's first court tracks remain sluggish, defeating the very purpose of their institution. This requires dribar investigation, lack of physical infrastructure, finance, sort of in dedicated judicial officials, and clear mandates perhaps are few factors for such slow in delivering justice. Now coming to the question of Assam, as I have looked into, Originally, and I'm told, 27 courts were allotted for Assam. Out of these, 10 POCSO courts are permanently manned by different judicial officers. In addition to that, Guwahati High Court, Governor of Assam, has notified certain, you know, intra-judicial institution, intra-judicial institution, and I have counted, there are five such intra-judicial institutions uh, constituted by Guwahati High Court on 11-4-2018. In 11-4-2018, High Court uh, established a few designated courts of session judge where there is no additional court of judge as fast-track court 
to try the cases of rape, murder, rape and murder of women and children on a day-to-day -day basis in eight districts. Then secondly, 14 additional session judge courts were designated as FTC, that is fast track court, to try this rape, murder, and rape and murder of women and children on a day-to-day -day basis. Thirdly, four additional second judge courts were designated as FTCs to try into these cases. Thus, 26 session courts have been designated as courts to look into these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Fifthly, 19 courts were designated as special courts under section 28 of the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012. In addition, apart from these institutions, in a revised order on 2nd January 2020, 16 districts and session courts are already designated as special courts under Section 28 of the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012 has been declared as courts exclusively with cases under POXO Act only. Now my conclusion is that we need to go beyond fast track court. We need to have a more as has already been illustrated by the you know the previous speaker who talked about the structural issues, the sociological issues, the psychological issues, the counseling issues. These are equally important along with an institutional approach. Of course, those cases need to be tried on a fast track basis. There is not an iota of doubt. But what I would argue is to go beyond fast track court and to look and address into the structural, sociological and other issues that come from such uh, you know scenario in our state particularly uh, north east network the representative is here honorita is there uh, purva bharati educational trust women in governance the women leadership training center and opto they talk about does they have already categorized various crimes against women and they have published a manifesto whereby they have argued for strengthening the panchayat system, safety committee at panchayats at the district and state level. I think these are wonderful suggestions and they have also argued for strengthening uh, various acts like an effective implementation of uh, protection of women from domestic violence, the Assam Witch Hunting uh, Prohibition Prevention and Protection Act and others which are indeed would, be, would go a long way in structurally resolving these issues. However, I would argue to develop more of a cluster approach and particularly after looking into those cases, I would say rather than treating them generically, we also need to look into in a more cluster manner, particularly in districts like Barpeta, Dhuguri, Dorong, Guwahati city, perhaps require urgent attention along with others. And on the government side, I shall try my best to sensitize our policymakers on these very important issues. With these issues and uh, my observation, I conclude. Thank you.